Oh, I tell you, this building is charged with the power of Almighty God. This is my 57th year of ministry. But I must tell you something, Charles. I have never in 57 years of ministry had a day with God like I have had today. You can put aside all of your commentaries. You can put aside almost everything that you have ever learned because I tell you, there is already over this conference a prophetic spirit. My whole body is on fire. You may be seated, and I'm going to move very quickly right into the prophetic. God gave me 10 prophecies for you today. I had, I'm telling you, I had the most glorious, wonderful sermon ready for you. And it's upstairs in my bedroom. And God said, I am going to release upon my people tonight an end time prophetic prayer anointing. Are you ready? Somebody say, God speaks to people today. First, God said, when you stand here in this school tonight, I want you to tell my people that this is going to be the greatest week of their life, seven incredible days. God said, I planned it as a personal victory for them. Oh, come on, I can't hear you back here. How many of you believe God speaks to people today? God said, I want you to tell my people. Now listen carefully. Don't write it down. I want you to listen. Put your notebooks aside. You got plenty of time with these great preachers that we've got lined up for you to take notes. Tonight, I want you to get divine impartation. I want the heavens to open. I want you to get so on fire here tonight that this week will be the greatest week you have ever experienced in your life. All right, second, are you ready? You believe God speaks to people? Second, God said tonight you tell my people, those that have come from near and far, God said tell them I know who you are. said, I know who you are, both young and old, both weak and strong, and God said, I know where you come from, and I know what spiritual state you are in, and God said, tonight, there's going to be something about tonight. Somebody say prophetic Amen. prayer Amen. anointing. Amen. Third thing God told me to tell you. Are you ready for this? Yeah. I told you God gave me 10 prophecies for you. Are you ready? Yeah. 
eyes can hear you. God said this prophetic prayer anointing. Now over this entire week of the school of ministry on prayer and intercession, there is going to be released a powerful prophetic. Now you'll understand what God means when we go from service to service and the teaching takes root very deep inside your spirit. But God said that this prophetic prayer anointing is going to spill over into dimensions that have only been known by my Old Testament prophets. I tell you, we are living in an awesome, incredible end time. Jesus is coming very soon. And this anointing is going to spill over into the realization of what God did for the Old Testament prophets and the Old Testament kings where the heavens were open, where the fire fell, where the mouths of lions were stopped, where the rivers were parted, where the waters were rolled back, where the cloud appeared, where the fire appeared, where the voice of God spoke, and where God came and made war upon the enemies of his people. Once again, we will see that in answer to prophetic prayer. Prophetic prayer. Prophetic prayer. It'll spill over like it did for Hezekiah. When God came with the angel in the middle of night and destroyed 185,000, we haven't understood yet what it means to have the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Elijah and Moses and Elisha and Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. You're going to move into a different dimension, a whole new dimension. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of man. God said, don't be afraid of governments. God said, don't be afraid of false religions. God said, don't be afraid of what the enemy will say against you. Don't be afraid of what the press will say. Don't be afraid of what the media will say. Don't be afraid of what the ungodly people will say. Because you have not chosen me. God said, I have chosen you. Somebody say, I'm not going to be afraid. You know why? You can stand up and shout anytime you want to. When Brother Shiloh does this, just be seated because I got to go a long ways tonight. I got 10 prophecies. I told you I've never had a day like this in my entire life in 57 years of ministry. I was shut off in a little room upstairs in my hotel suite and the glory of God filled it like the temple and God said, I've got 10 prophecies for my people to start out this prophetic prayer conference. God said, don't be afraid because your words are going to be mingled with a powerful prayer anointing that whatsoever you are going to ask in the name of my son, Jesus, I am going to give it to you. I have longed for this day. You have no idea. I said, you have no idea 
how I have longed for this day. I'm tired of being sick and tired of reading about these things, of what God has done for our prophets of old and for what God has done in the early church. And we sit here like pumps on a log, warming church pews, having wonderful religious worship services, but yet the fulfillment of the prophetic destiny that God is who he claims to be is not seen or manifested but that day is over the time has come <laughs> 10 years ago the spirit of god came to mars and god said to me son put a prayer covering over this entire world. I wondered how that would ever take place. You know, the true test of every prophet of God is that what he speaks will come to pass. One year ago, almost this very month, we were in San Diego, California. And the Spirit of God came upon Morris, and I prophesied, do you remember, Charles, what was going to happen in the United States of America? And we launched the Save America Now campaign in January, and God showed us what was going to take place on the political terrain of this nation. Well, now look back. I don't think you heard me. I said, look back. Every word spoken from the lips of that prophet of God way back there in San Diego, California, and many of you were there and heard those prophecies. They have all begun to come to pass. When I began to prophesy that this would be the year of the most destructive weather conditions we have ever had in America and in the world, people looked at me and said, what has that got to do with anything? I'll tell you what it has to do with. It has to do with the fact that the devil is not in control, but that God is in control and he knows exactly what's going to happen and it has happened. Luke 11, 1, Jesus prayed, and then his disciples cried out, Lord, teach us to pray. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next services. But that's what we've come here for. You got one of the most beautiful settings in all the world, this wonderful hotel. But you didn't come here for vacation. Come on, somebody say, I came here for God to teach me how to pray. Just preceding Luke 11, 1, when the disciples cried, Lord, teach us to pray, Jesus entered a village where he encountered Martha and Mary. And you remember the story, how Martha complained to Jesus about Mary and how Jesus said that she has chosen the best part I just want to put this into your spirit just a little bit here tonight because whenever you put God first in your life, somebody say first. first. I don't know whether you know what that means because we've got all kinds of religious theories today. God expects us to be balanced. I don't know, well, I'm sorry. Only thing I ever heard about God in the Bible was he called us to fanaticism. I said, whenever you put God first in your life, the kitchen dishes may stack up. And 
said, don't get mad at me, mama. The TV will take second place. Recreation will take second and third place. You will be concentrating so much on those things that you like to do in the natural world. When you begin to put God first in your life, you'll find out that God will make demands on you that will take almost every bit of your time and energy because he's a jealous God. He won't search. He won't share it with the bowling alleys. Now it all depends on how deep and how far you want to go. Personally, I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. I want to see what God has for us on the other end, brother. When a man or a woman is completely sold out to him and sit there, sits at the feet of the master because he desires the best thing. Hey! Now, I'm not going to preach on this tonight, but I am sometime during this week. Jesus went on after he gave them the Lord's Prayer, which he never intended to be a prototype. Now, we could talk about that, but I'm not going to touch that tonight. He went on to teach a spiritual dynamic to overcome unanswered prayer. And that's one of the subjects that Morris is going to deal with during this week. The spiritual dynamic that goes beyond the natural world that enables us to enter into a new dimension where there is no unanswered prayer. You ready for the rest of the prophecies? God said our prayers will change from ordinary prayers to powerful prophetic prayers. See, God is waiting for his people to stop praying. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. He is waiting for us to pray in the spirit. You want to save America? Come on. You want to turn your nation around? You've got to come become a prophetic prayer warrior. Why? Because when you enter into the prophetic, then you begin to understand the will of God. I can't hear you guys back here. I said, then you understand the will of God. And the only kind of prayer that really matters is prayer that prays, thy will be done. Do you think Jesus relished going to the cross? Anybody see the Passion movie? Let me see your hand. Do you think Jesus relished taking the crown of thorns in his brow? Do you think Jesus relished being beaten? But he prayed in that garden of Gethsemane until he sweat drops of blood. So great was his anguish. And he cried, not my will, but thine be done. We're going to find out under this prophecy that the key 
that God will continually be bringing unto us is this revelation in the Spirit. Romans, go to bed tonight, or before you go to bed tonight, read the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. We'll find out that the same spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead is in us. <laughs> read 1 Corinthians 3.16, and you'll find out that your bodies are the temples of what? Of the Holy Spirit. The key all this week, you will hear it come from teacher after teacher, is this a call to know how to pray in the Spirit prophetically. You can't pray the will of God prophetically unless you pray in the Spirit. We don't know what to pray for says Romans and we don't know how to pray as we ought to pray but the spirit <laughs> the spirit does what prays through us with groanings and moanings somebody shout prophecy Hear me. God said to tell you he's going to take us into the spirit world. Into a new strategic level of prophetic praying. There'll not be any power of the enemy that will be able to stand before what God will put in your spirit. The devil is not in control. Who's in control? God is in control. And who has the power? I can't hear you. No, God gave us the power. Come on, did you ever read Luke 10, 19? I said, God gave us the power. Behold, Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses. Oh, come on, who has the power? Come on, put your hand on your chest and say, I do. I do. Somebody shout prophecy. God is going to bring us into a new dimension of authority and power in our prayers where our words spoken with this new level of authority that is going to be invested in the promises of God will enable us, like Jeremiah, root out, tear down, every stronghold of the enemy. Are you ready for this? Somebody say, my words invested in the promises of God. That's prophetic praying. I don't think you heard me. I said, that's prophetic praying. That's prayer that goes beyond the natural. When your words are invested into the very promises of God. Luke 16, 20, listen to it. When that time comes, said Jesus, you will ask nothing of me. You will need to ask me 
no questions. I assure you, most solemnly, I tell you that my Father will grant you whatever you ask in my name. Come on, somebody say it's time for that to become a reality. Come on, God's giving us a wake up call. Are you ready? Wake up! John 16, 19, 22 and 23. Again, listen to it. In a little while, you'll see me, said Jesus. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy in that day. You will no longer ask me anything. Anybody want a new dimension of a prophetic, powerful, prophetic prayer anointing. Your words invested in the promises of God. I tell you the truth. You will no longer ask me anything. My Father will give you I don't know if I dare tell you this. I, I, I think we got too much of the natural up here in our mind to go this far in this breakthrough and this dimension. Are you ready? Are you ready? My Father will give you whatsoever you ask in my name. Either Jesus was the Son of God and he was telling the truth or he was the biggest liar that ever lived. Somebody shout in that day. After I have arisen from the dead. Somebody shout in that day. After I have defeated Satan and stripped him of his power. Somebody say in that day that I have broken the power of sin, sickness, and death. Somebody say, in that day, when I am exalted above all power and principality and given a name that is above every name, somebody shout, in that day, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, I will do it. We are living in that day. Somebody say prophecy. prophecy. I tell you, I have never had a day like this in my life. 57 years. I have been alone with God many times in hours of prayer and intercession. But never did the windows of heaven open upon me as they opened. Never did I see the glory of God as I saw the glory of God today. Never did I hear the voice of God so clear as I have heard the voice of God today. Somebody say, there's something special about tonight. I got to go quickly. God said to tell you, I'm going to have a people in this end time hour. God said my hand is going to be strong upon them. God said my glory is going to cover them. 
God said they will live and breathe and function on a new level of spiritual dimension of prayer that will enable them to supersede every natural limitation. Are you ready for this? I don't know how far you want to go. I don't know what you came here for. I don't know what you came here for, but I know why I am here. God said, son, tell my people, they're going to know that this end time prophetic prayer anointing is coming is upon them because I will raise up a prayer shield over them. Oh my God. I'll raise up a prayer shield over them. I said, God, what do you mean by a spiritual, a prayer shield? And God said, a prayer covering is a huge spiritual shield that is raised up by this end time prophetic prayer anointing that surrounds your family, surrounds your home, surrounds your finances. Oh my God. That even by the grace of God, you can raise it up to surround your church and change the circumstances of your church. You don't have to sit back and accept the status quo. That's why you're here. Several others, they'll wait till the next night. When Peter and John, you remember when they were put in prison? When they were released from prison, you remember? After they were beaten, persecuted, they were commanded not to speak in the name of Jesus. There's something strange that happened here. They didn't call a deacon's meeting and request what they should do. And I don't say that to be facetious. I just say it because it's true. The only thing that came from their innermost spirit was not a strategy. What are we going to do because the religious leaders and everybody is telling us, don't speak in Jesus' name. Don't pass out tracts on the street because it's against the civil liberties. I'm not going there. In fact, I, I want to go quickly for just a moment to the book of Acts and the, well, the fourth chapter and the 29th and the 31st verse. It's a strange thing. They didn't even ask God to stop the persecution. You would have thought that they would have started to pray for somehow that there could be an escape mechanism for them to escape out of the future persecution that they would face, but they never prayed for God to stop the persecution. They prayed for the power and boldness to proclaim the gospel in the face of persecution and even death. Now, 
I'm standing up here tonight and I'm telling you in Jesus' name, we are not looking for the God of Elijah. Now I want you to get this. We are not looking for the God of Elisha. We are not looking for the God of Moses. We're not looking for the God of Abraham. We're not looking for the God of Jacob. We're not looking for the God of Jeremiah. We're not looking for the God of Hezekiah. What I am asking God to do is to give us the Jeremiah's, the Hezekiah's, the Elijah's, the Moses, the Abraham's, the Peter's, the Paul's, the John of today. Hey! Sakabababahando! Listen to the prayer, Acts 4, 29. I've got to read this because it's so powerful. I'm going to stop. I didn't say I was finished. I'm going to continue this message for a whole week. Somebody say, God brought me here. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Devil, you take that. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thy hand to heal. I got to stop here for a moment. There's something about this healing. I want you to listen because you've been too intimidated. Don't look at me with that look. I love you anyhow. I said, I love you anyhow. There's something about this healing business that's important to God. And brother, if it's important to God, we better get back to it. We better get back to it in the church. We better get back to it so that we don't have to lean on the arm of flesh. We better get back to the healing business. There's something about healing. Father, please don't give me any more, please. Then Jesus, Luke 9, just brought this to me, Luke 9. Jesus called together the 12 and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. Now, why didn't they say something else? Why didn't they say, God, give us boldness to speak so eloquently so that we might be able to convince them? Why did he say, give us boldness and power and authority to heal? Is anybody ready to break? God wants you to get back into the healing business, Pastor. Go ahead, you can speak in tongues. I got another scripture coming. Oh my God. Yes, Lord, I'll read it. I'll read it. I'll read it as soon as I get to it. Hallelujah. 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 Matthew 10 1. And Jesus summoned to him his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority. Come on. This manifestation of prophetic prayer anointing is going to result 
in your words being spoken with a new power and a new authority. Now get this. He gave them power and authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure. I can't imagine today a preacher daring to stand up in the pulpit of the 20th century and say, I have the power to heal. But I'm telling you, God spoke to me several months ago. He said, Morris, you've been building my army, but now I want you to get back to healing my sick. I give you power of unclean spirits to drive them out to cure all kinds of diseases and all kinds of weaknesses and all kinds of infirmities. Hey. Hey. God, I will read it. Please be patient with me. Another one just coming to me. Are you ready? Come on. Are you ready? Let me see if I can find this here. Oh, glory to God. Help me, Lord. Where is it? Help me, Lord. My Jesus. My Jesus. This, this is really the greatest one. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Come on, are you ready? There's something about this healing business. First Corinthians 12, 28. Listen, First Corinthians 12, 28. So God has appointed some in the church for his own use. Somebody say, this is not the work of a man, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't forget that. It's not that you have the power to heal the sick in yourself but it's his power his spirit his anointing it's Christ in you know you not that your bodies are the temples Christ in you He appointed some in the church for his own use. First apostles, second messengers, uh, special messengers, second prophets, inspired preachers and expounders, thirdly teachers. Then, I don't know if there's any here tonight. Wonder workers. Oh my God, wouldn't it be great if tonight such an anointing came upon us? We died to self, we fell into the ground like that corn of wheat and died until that spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead came inside us with such incredible manifestation for his own use. Wonder workers, that's not all. Are you ready? Are you ready? Then those with the ability to heal the sick. Want me to go on? Feel, feel. Fill scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. God has given to us the power to heal the sick. Why? Because sickness is the result of man's rebellion against God. And God came here to destroy all the power of the enemy. Sin, sickness, death. There's something about this healing business. Somebody raise your right hand up to God and say, I'm not going to be satisfied in this conference until I get my healing. Come on. 
get your hands up, get your hands up. I'm talking about you sitting out there with sugar diabetes, heart trouble, emphysema, blood pressure. Know ye not, your bodies are the temples of the Holy Ghost. Temples of the Holy Ghost. Temples of the Holy Ghost. I don't know what this means. Acts 5.21. I don't know what it means, but I know it's there. Acts 5.12. By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought amongst the people. I don't know how... Satan succeeded in the church to get us to compromise, to get us to backslide, to get us to be satisfied with the status quo, walking in, sitting down, listening to the wonderful music, getting a nice good sermon, paying our tithes, I don't know how he succeeded, but I know he has. I gotta stop. <sighs> Jesus. Did you ever read the book by Paul Billheimer, Destined to the Throne? Did you read that book? Did you read it, Charles? He said this, and I'm quoting from the book. Prayer is not begging God to do something that he is unwilling to do. It is not overcoming God's reluctance, but prayer is enforcing the victory of that Christ won over Satan. Prayer is implementing on earth heaven's decision concerning the kingdom. Oh my God, somebody, I gotta stop. I gotta stop. We're not even near finished. We're just starting to scratch the surface. Put your hands up. In Jesus' name, Kapo Sandara Bahata, yea, yea.